Krumer Media's Policy, I'm Sash Numadi. Joining me today is political scientist Stephen Friedman discussing his book, One Virus, Two Countries. Now, in your book, you write that the reason why South Africa was not compared with the rest of Africa in its initial COVID-19 response was because of deep-rooted bias. Can you just unpack that for us? I think it is still, and uh, I mean, certainly politicians are still saying this, but I hear it from non-politicians too. It's still uh, an assumption in South Africa that we did very well in our response to COVID-19. Uh, and I argue in the book that it's very, you know, that that's simply not so, to, to be blunt. Besides the fact that we had, uh, I mean, officially we've had, as we're speaking today, almost 100,000 deaths. Uh, but some people have woken up to what has been clear for a long time, which is that it, it was a great deal more than that. Because if you look at the uh, excess death count of the Medical Research Council, and basically what they do there is that they take... Uh, uh, the number of people who've died of natural causes in the last five to ten years, I'm not sure what the span is, uh, as a sort of average. And then they look at how many people have died of natural causes now. And essentially, since the pandemic started, uh, around 300,000 more people have passed away than uh, would, would, would have been the pattern previously. So that isn't a hugely imp uh, great, impressive record. Uh, secondly, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, if you simply take the official figures, in other words, those who officially tested positive and those who passed away, uh, then for much of 2020, and the book is about 2020, it's about the first wave with the bit on the second, you see that uh, our deaths and cases were roughly the same as the whole of Africa put together. Um, now, I, I notice it's reared its head again. Whenever you mention this, there are people who stand up and say, oh, that's because... Uh, Africa doesn't do a lot of testing. South Africa's own medical scientists who, who would have an interest because uh, they were very influential, they would have an interest in, 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 in trying to show that actually we did much better than uh, the rest of the continent. They have acknowledged that uh, if you look at hospital admissions, if you look at death figures, if you look at uh, all the evidence, uh, that we did do a lot more poorly than most African countries. So why then do we think that we did well? And that is because we compare ourselves uh, to countries who did worse. We compare ourselves to the United Kingdom, the United States, who are two of the worst performers in the world on COVID-19. Uh, we also compare ourselves to a certain extent to Western Europe, which weren't as bad as the US or the UK, but had many, many cases and, and, and many, many people passed away. Um, so that's what we're comparing ourselves to, you know, and we say, well, we didn't have the kind of pressure on our hospitals that the Americans and the British had. Uh, but we're not a Western European country. Why was this? Because uh, we're fixated on, on those countries. Uh, I argue in, in, in the other book I, I published recently, Prisoners of the Past, that uh, we're a society divided into insiders and outsiders, and the insiders who decided how we should respond to COVID-19 are people who uh, really are obsessed with, uh, with, with those countries. Uh, so you didn't even notice uh, that we were being outperformed by the rest of the continent, which we very often turn our noses up because nobody cares about the rest of the continent. I mean, I mentioned in the book, for example, that uh, mm -hmm. Professor Karim, who was uh, co-chair of the Medical Advisory Council, a world-renowned scientist, uh, I mean, look, he was honest enough at one point to say, look, you know, these African cases are not because they're not testing, it's because... And then he said, well, I, it's, it's a total mystery to me, I don't know. Now, on one level, it's, uh, the humility is refreshing. On the other level, I ask in the book, well, what would you do if, if you were a scientist and you didn't know? You'd get out of your colleagues in those countries and say, well, what, what's happening here? And he doesn't seem to have done that. And I'm simply singling him out because he happened to be the, in a sense, that the top medical scientist uh, as far as policy was concerned at the time. I mean, it was quite obvious from the way his colleagues responded that they weren't terribly interested. Uh, I mean, very often, if you looked at what our medical scientists said, you would get the impression that Africa was on another planet. Our insiders don't really think Africa is important. They're a bit embarrassed by it. They very often say, well, you know, the World Health Organization figures 
show that it was much worse in Africa than we imagine. Well, what they ignore is the fact that unlike them, the World Health Organization, for some strange reason, thinks that South Africa's in Africa. So the World Health Organization always includes South Africa's figures in the African figures. Uh, uh, South Africans' uh, insiders would never do something like that. Now, your book also suggests that while South Africa said it would follow the science um, at the onset of the outbreak, the particular route that we followed might have veered from this course. Just tell us about that. Well, I think the most important point I'm trying to make is what does following the science mean? Because it means that there's one clear science which tells us what to do and we follow that and then we do the best we can. Besides the fact that, uh, the, you know, we, we're fixated on the West now, there is a, there is a legitimate and reasonable uh, uh, reason why people felt this about COVID-19. Uh, and that is our recent, you know, our, our re relatively recent history of dealing with HIV and AIDS. Uh, because the, the, the big cry during the HIV and AIDS and pressure on the government was follow the side. But there was a huge difference between HIV AIDS and COVID-19. And the huge difference was that by the time HIV and AIDS became an issue in this country, uh, there were medications. Uh, follow the science. When people demanded people follow the science, essentially what they were saying is um, distribute antiretroviral medication to people so that they can, uh, can live with this virus rather than die from it. But we didn't have the equivalent of antiretrovirals. I mean, we're beginning right now. They're beginning to come onto the market. But, uh, you know, even now, uh, uh, you know, drug companies have, have, have in effect invented what is pretty much a cure for COVID-19. I think it costs something like 30,000 rand for the course of medication. So, you know, South Africans can't afford that. But at, at the time, there was nothing which was particularly why I found it odd that we were continually told that we were protecting the hospitals uh, because, um, you know, it was assumed that if somebody got into a hospital, they would recover. But sadly, many people who went into hospital didn't recover because th th there was no cure. So what was the hospitals going to do for them? So the point is that that wasn't the case with COVID-19. And therefore, unlike HIV AIDS, where, where everybody except the lunatic fringe agreed what the problem was scientifically and what the solution was, there were different sciences. There were, I mean, obviously not in the sense of how the virus worked, et cetera. But the science we followed was actually a particular science. It was a minority science. Uh, and it was the science, once again, of people in... Maybe, you know, the UK, the US, etc., uh, who in effect said, well, we just uh, allow this virus to, to, to spread because most people recover. And then we simply protect the vulnerable, uh, which was always ridiculous, to be quite frank, because, you know, for starters in this country, as I mentioned a moment, you know, we have 5 million people plus living with HIV and AIDS. They're all vulnerable. How, how do you protect 5 million people if you don't have restriction? Um, so that was the science we followed. You know, right at the beginning, Professor Karim made the statement that a severe epidemic of, of uh, COVID-19 was inevitable in South Africa. Uh, and although he said it, uh, once again, his colleagues agreed with him, uh, there was never a discussion among medical scientists in this country or in the public debate about how we kept the numbers of COVID-19 uh, down to a level where uh, we had the kind of deaths and case numbers of, for example, South Korea. Uh, I mean, South Korea is a very interesting example. Okay, it might be socioeconomically different from us, but it has just about the same number of people as we have. Whereas our official death toll is nearly 100,000, their official death toll is 7,000. Uh, but we never had that discussion. We never said, well, how do we learn from the Koreans? We never, you know, we obviously never tried to work from, learn from the, the Togolese and the Rwandans, uh, which we should have done. And so that was the science which was followed. Professor Gray, who was then, you know, who became sort of martyr, who was then head of the Medical Research Council, uh, claimed that all the lockdown regulations were nonsensical and unscientific. She was basing her understanding of, of science on a fringe group in, in the UK, uh, you know, who were 
honoured by the Trump administration and, and, and right-wingers around the world because, in effect, they were saying, you know, who cares about a major virus if you, if you can keep the economy going? That's the, the first point, uh, you know, is, is to say that, you know, there were different sciences and, and uh, you know, we allowed uh, the establishment here to pass off one science as the only science. Uh, the second one is to say, well, well f- what, what science are you talking about? Because when they talked about science, they were talking about medical science. You know, medical science can be incredibly useful in in situations, but it has its limits. Uh, And when you have a situation, as as the one I talked about a moment ago, where you have a situation where there's no cure, where the medics keep on saying that, uh, fair enough, uh, that they're learning about this every day, uh, you know, it, it changes the whole time. Uh, we all know that when it started, we were, you know, we were told to be absolutely vigilant about the surfaces we touched, and then it turned out that it wasn't about the surfaces we touched; it was about ventilation and and and, and being, uh, you know, too close to people and so forth. There are other brands of human knowledge, and 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 one of them is what is called, uh, the so, you know, social sciences, which were totally ignored throughout. Uh, nobody bothered to ask. Uh, psychologists and uh, sociologists and anthropologists, how you got uh, people to work with you to fight a pandemic. So, so, you know, that science, in a sense, was discarded. And then finally, for all this talk about following the science all over the world, uh, if it's politically necessary or politically expedient or economically necessary to avoid, to ignore the science, uh, the science gets ignored and people trumpet that they're going to listen to the science. So, for example, the way in which we handled lockdowns uh, was once again, you know, was supposed to be scientific and there was all this uh, modeling and uh, talk about, you know, risk-adjusted strategies, etc. But essentially what was really going on was a bunch of lobby groups pressing the government to open up things. Uh, despite the fact that any, you know, if you look, I mean, you know, any uh, public health person will tell you uh, that if you're dealing with a pandemic, an epidemic like COVID-19, you open up when case numbers are going down, not when they're going up. We started opening up when case numbers were going up. And the reason we did this is because the religious sector and, and, and businesses, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, were lobbying. Uh, the suburban middle class, I pointed out in the book, uh, were happy with restrictions for three weeks. And then when they realized that this was actually going to be with us for a long time, they started mobilizing against it and, 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 and uh, denouncing the government. And therefore, we had a process in which very little of what was done in this country uh, f- followed even the science that uh, people claimed they were following. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were told that if you had more than 90 cases a day, you, you had to keep these restrictions in place. Well, you know, at one stage, we, you know, we had 20,000 cases a day and, and, and most of the restrictions have been gone. So, you know, it becomes an excuse, quite frankly. Some slack has to be cut for the fact that people were, were very often basing their reactions on HIV and AIDS and not realizing that they were dealing with something totally different. Uh, but beyond that, you know, it, it, it does have to do with, you know, the way in which the society operates. Um, you know, and essentially, the insiders don't like the government because they think that it's an outsider government, even though it's an insider government. But they do like scientists because scientists are considered to be, uh, you know, respectable. Uh, so, you know, it was in everybody's interest to pretend that the science, A, the scientists knew what ought to be done, and B, that we were doing that. But, but neither of those statements were true. Uh, the scientists didn't know what ought to be done, and when international experience told us what was scientifically required, we ignored it, because the Pentecostal churches and the travel agents didn't like it. And you also write in the book that the media didn't play an effective enough role during the pandemic? I think the media played a disgraceful role. I I mean, I don't like using terms like that, but I think that it has to be said. You know, we hear a huge amount in this country about these cliches like speaking truth to power and accountability and watchdog to society, etc. 
But none of that was, uh, none of that happened. You know, I've talked about the scientists. Um, during the whole of 2020 and most of 2021, not a single media person asked a single critical question of any medical scientist, okay? So that literally meant that if you had medical doctor behind your name, uh, particularly if you happen to have, a, you know, a, a, a chair at some university or whatever, you could literally say anything and you would not be held to account. Now, I mention in the book a, a particular scientist, who once again I'm thinking, I mean, I haven't mentioned his name in these discussions before, but it is Shabir Mahdi at first. Shabir Mahdi at one stage in the process conducted a public campaign against the government for accepting the recommendations of a study that he'd conducted. Now, that's not rational behavior. But nobody said to Professor Bodhi, why are you doing this? You know, you ran the study. It was the study on AstraZeneca. He ran the study, which said that it wasn't terribly effective. He was interviewed by the BBC, and he told the BBC, in effect, well, we hope uh, that this means that uh, it protects against severe disease and illness, but we don't know. A month later, he's out there being interviewed uh, as a celebrity, which he remains to this day, telling people that we have an evil government because they want to know the AstraZeneca vaccine in despite the fact that, and ignoring the fact, in fact, trying to deflect attention from the fact that he was the scientist who ran the study. So, you know, that is an extreme example. I mean, I mentioned Professor Gray earlier. You know, she became a celebrity. She was given awards and all sorts of things. You know, as I say, basically what she was doing was, uh, I mean, she changed her tune afterwards when she was put in charge of the vaccine studies. Uh, but at that stage, you know, she was echoing the views of scientists uh, who were regarded as cranks by most of their colleagues. You know, when that happened in HIV and AIDS, quite rightly, people were ridiculed. Uh, you know, here they were given uh, awards and, 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 and accorded celebrity status. Uh, and that is hugely important, you know, because the media in this country prides itself on giving the government a hard time. Uh, and in a democracy, the media should give the government a hard time. But it doesn't give a hard time to, to, to those people who are considered by the insiders to, to be reputable, and scientists are among them. You don't need medical knowledge. I've never studied medicine in my life to know that the statement at the beginning, the argument was that we had to have a severe epidemic because no country could escape one. At the time the statement was made, it was clearly untrue, and I don't know this because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a medical doctor. I know this because I follow the news, because we were getting news reports of what was happening in Korea, in, 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 in some parts of Africa, in New Zealand, uh, in, in a whole host of countries. It wasn't inevitable at all. Um, but nobody, none of, nobody in the media said, which is surely basic to the job of media, to say, well, on what do you base that statement? Well, what's your evidence? And, and, and to say, well, you know, how about this contrary? Look, it was, it's not only the media. Uh, I mean, in a sense, you know, one of the ways in which, you know, I'm a student of democracy and one of the, you know, important ways in which a student, a, a democratic society is supposed to operate uh, is that, you know, the media and citizens' organizations and interest groups, etc., cetera, uh, make sure that there's accountability for decisions which affect the public. There was no accountability here at all. The only accountability there was was quite late in the process, which was for corruption relating to PPEs. And obviously there should be accountability for that. Besides giving the medical uh, scientists a free pass. Uh, another shocking failure of accountability is that, uh, you know, when the first lockdown was introduced, we were told quite rightly, because that's the way you, you, you fight COVID-19, that the purpose, one of the purposes of this was to put in place a testing and a tracing system. Uh, because really, you know, lockdowns uh, are very costly and they, uh, they don't get rid of the virus. You, you, you know, the reason Korea did so well in some other countries is that they just had very effective testing and tracing systems. Now, what happened here is that, and all of this was reported, is that uh, any prospect of an effective testing and tracing system 
was destroyed because cases were piling up at the national laboratory. So tests would be taken and they'd go to the laboratory and it would come, come back three days later or in some cases three weeks later. And that means you can't fight the virus because what you're supposed to do is, is get a, as immediately as you can a sense, okay, this person is infected. Uh, you find out from the person who they've been in contact with. You trace those people. You isolate those people. And that's how you spread to stop the virus spread. So whether that was possible or not uh, in this country, I think it was. Others think it wasn't. The fact of the matter is that one way of in trying to ensure that we could fight this virus in a way which would keep deaths and cases low and still enable most of the economy to function, uh, didn't work because of the collapse of what the state laboratory was doing. There was no controversy about it. Nobody, I mean, it was occasionally mentioned in newspapers or uh, on broadcast media. You know, nobody said to, 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 to the Minister of Health, why, why is this happening? Uh, nobody phoned up the head of the laboratory to say, you know, what's going on here? So, you know, if you have a situation in which there is no accountability uh, about your most effective means of dealing with the virus, civil society, the media, etc., cetera, are just not doing their job. And they didn't do their job. Um, and, and, and that was a major contributor because if we'd had right at the beginning, for example, people saying, well, you know, it's not true that uh, a severe epidemic is, is inevitable. And, uh, you know, if, if scientists are going to be any use to us, then please start advising us on what we can do to prevent it rather than to, to, to cope with the after effects. If that had happened right at the beginning, maybe we would not be talking about uh, 300,000 deaths. There'd be massive uh, pressure to to fix the testing function, maybe also we would have had very few uh, cases and deaths. So, yeah, this is a case in which, uh, on an issue which you know, literally affects the, the lives and well being of every single South African, the system failed. That was author Stephen Friedman discussing his book, One Virus, Two Countries.